Kevlin Henning. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, people keep talking about lambdas a lot these days. And uh, I do want to go into the historical context here. Um, honestly, if you can have a favorite Greek letter, this is probably my top three. It's just there's an elegance to it. It's not always rendered well in certain typefaces, but if you get the right typeface, it's just like, yeah, this looks good. Now, the thing is, people like it so much that they use it absolutely everywhere. You've got people like Amazon, AWS, we're going to call it Lambda, even though it's got nothing to do with Lambdas. This has confused a generation of people who are entering software and who've not come across the deeper ideas here. Um, there's another generation of people who immediately associate <laughs> this with Half-Life, where it actually borrows from the decay constant in physics. And because physicists don't really use namespaces or long names, it also means wavelength if you're in a different part of physics. And it refers to calculus. And that's the one that I'm going to cover today. Because obviously, I've got the after lunch slot. So I'm going to talk about lambda calculus. That's, yeah. <laughs> what was I thinking? OK, because I've talked previously about meaning when I've been here. I've talked about history. So I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but there's going to be a lot of code, and there might be some brain-melting ideas, but that's fine. You can sleep through those if you need to. I, I understand it. Um, appreciate that. So everybody's getting really excited about lambdas. Um, it's just like, oh, yeah, because you know this is like 21st century programming languages. Yeah, we're all really cool. We're all really functional and stuff like that. Well, it all goes back to Alonzo Church. And this is his 1936 paper, An Unsolvable Problem of Elementary Number Theory. This is where he, he didn't actually introduce lambda calculus um, at this point. This is the paper that's normally cited for this. He actually introduced it in 1932, but I've not been able to find that paper, and there were some corrections uh, to do this. And he wasn't sitting around saying, you know, Whew, what cool language features can I do yet? Because it's the 1930s. Programming languages are not yet a thing. And he actually doesn't really care about all of that. He just casually introduces it really quickly as an idea. You know, you're like about two or three pages in, and boom, he's just done all of Lambda Caps. So, wow, that was quick, which is why it took people a while to figure out that's also quite cool. He was actually using it simply as a means to address something else. And the unsolvable problem uh, in this case is uh, the Entscheidungs problem, um, which is related to things like the halting problem uh, and so on. Um, Turing, uh, Turing used the Turing machine to demonstrate this. Lambda calculus has been shown to be an equivalent formalism. And this was at a point in history, now I'm not going to pretend to be a mathematician. Um, it's one of those interesting things that, depending on who you talk to, you suddenly realize how much of either an imposter you are or how, um, uh, how much you actually know. From the point of view of a mathematician, I know nothing. I have uh, degrees in physics and computer science. I am not even close to being a mathematician. On the other hand, you talk to people who've come into software from other disciplines, or you talk to people who don't even deal with software, and suddenly you are a mathematical god, okay? Simply because you know more than a few symbols and can freely use Greek, uh, Greek letters without even batting an eyelid. So from my point of view, I am not a mathematician. How do I know this? I can't read more than a few pages of this paper without like the, the, the sheer g-forces of uh, <laughs> proof going past me, going like, I'm going to need to reread that to really understand it. But this was a period in time, the 1930s. There's was a lot of change in the 1930s. We seem to be revisiting some of it, unfortunately. But a lot of old certainties were being thrown away. And uh, the idea, an idea that was kind of formulated, well, I guess we started to believe it towards the end of the 19th century. Everything could be addressed and solvable and complete we could know, everything was knowable. Everything had um, a certainty attached to it. And culminated, 1911, Russell and Whitehead, um, Bertram Russell and uh, Alfred North Whitehead, published Principia Mathematica with the goal of providing a solid foundation for all the mathematics, that it's provable, consistent, and all the rest of it. And uh, a young Austrian mathematician, Kurt Gödel, came along with his incompleteness theorems to um, shatter the dream, showing that for any consistent axiomatic system, there will always be theorems that cannot be proven within the system. 
it turns out that there's a whole load of stuff you just can't say and demonstrate within this. We actually encounter this on a daily basis in software development, but don't recognize it as that. Okay, in terms of, can I recreate this bug in this situation? Can I test this um, for all the possible situations within this situation? No, you actually have to step outside it. We even see it applies to concepts like machine learning. Um, which has, there's huge ethical consequences here, so it actually turns out philosophically it relates to ethics. Uh, one premise of many models of fairness in machine learning is that you can measure or prove the fairness of a machine learning model from within the system, i.e. from the properties of the model itself and perhaps the data it is trained on. A lot of people are trying to do this. Don't bother. It was shown in 1931, you can't do this. The system that can demonstrate its appropriateness or suitability or correctness lies outside the system that you are building. To show that a machine learning model is fair, you need information from outside of the system. It's the only way to assess it. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, uh, black holes came along. So Einstein messed up a few things. You know, we, we thought we, we knew everything, and then 1915, uh, he presented in 1916, he published the general theory of relativity, and um, in that, basically, there's a lot of really cool stuff in it, and then some people said, wait a minute, there's a thing here that drops out of the equations, a thing called we now call a black hole, which is a boundary of everything that we can know. It's all over the place. Our certainty and ability to know everything shattered over a, just a period of a few short years. Um, and we have Douglas Adams to summarize. Oh, by the way, 42, it's the 42nd anniversary of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. Now, we've got them. And Alonzo Church helped describe them. Now, up until around 1960, though, lambda calculus was a minor curiosity, never really had any major impact on anything except being a simple proof system. Um, in the late 1950s, uh, John McCarthy and others designed the Lisp language. It was first implemented in 1960. And actually, lambdas finally made their way into the world of computing and the consideration there. Uh, there. Um, so we should probably talk about what lambdas are. Um, a lot of people have these uh, various different uh, thoughts on them. So I found this on a, um, a Ruby uh, tutorial site. Despite the fancy name, it's a letter. Don't get excited. We have other languages that are named after letters, like C. Nobody gets fancy about that one. It's just like, oh, OK, that's just a familiar alphabet. The minute you throw in something exotic, it's just like, oh, OK, it's a Greek letter. OK, that's suddenly all very cool. OK, just from a kind of Swedish point of view, you've got a couple of extra letters you could be using here. OK? Just <laughs> so, you know, make it fancy. Just use things that aren't in the traditional ASCII set. Despite the fancy name, a lambda is just a function peculiarly without a name. And there's an opportunity here that many people have overlooked. If we look at Phil Carton's classic quote, in computer science, there are only two hard things, cache and validation naming things. We've just solved one of them. <laughs> Let us not have names. Names are hard. Let us have nameless things. And cache and validation, well, that's all about side effects. If we're going to talk about functional programming, there are no side effects. Yeah, functional programming is so cool that you don't even need to plug your computer in. Okay, that's, you know, if, you, if somebody says, I've got a pure functional program, just go up, rip the battery pack out, see if it still runs. And if it does, yes, you do have a pure functional program. <laughs> Using electricity as a side effect, phew, we spit on side effects. <laughs> anyway, we've just solved computer science because, you know, cache and validation is not relevant to us. We're done. Okay, you can go home. You can have your nap now. Let's go back to church. So, let's see what he said about this. So he introduces a notation. Uh, he was ahead of the curve here, included curly brackets. We select a particular list of symbols consisting of the symbols, et cetera, et cetera, and an innumerably infinite set of symbols. Whoa, that's pretty cool. A, B, C, et cetera, to be called variables. Um, and we define one, the word formula to mean any finite sequence of symbols out of this list. So this is interesting, because what we're doing here is we are taking the idea, traditionally, of what a function is. A function, historically, is a named thing. The name appears on the left-hand side. It's part of the definition. And then we say there's stuff over here. Mathematically, that can be a formula. Programmatically, that's going to be some code. But what we're doing here is we're saying, actually, functions are not a separate kind of thing. Functionals are a kind of value. And we, get, we can use abbreviations, but those are abbreviations. They are not themselves actually the definition of the function. 
So really the function is here. Turns out that there are three laws of lambdas, as it were. There are three things that make a lambda a lambda. One, you can have variables. Okay, simple, simple idea, but nonetheless, it's there. And two, you have functional abstraction. What you're doing is you're saying, I have something here, this variable applies within this particular context. And there is a formula there, and you can apply a lambda to another value. Okay, that's it, application. That's it, your, your three things are done there. There are a couple of other things we can note. So for example, an abbreviation is just that. Um, Church uses them in his paper. It's an abbreviation. What's interesting is that it's basically an alias. As an abbreviation, it means that the F is equivalent to the thing on the right-hand side. Textually, it expands like that. It means that F cannot appear on the right-hand side. Basically, it means that lambda calculus does not have recursion, which for a lot of people come, wait a minute, hang on, I thought this was all functional stuff. Isn't that all recursion? It's like, no, you have to use crazy things called fixed point combinators, which are beyond the scope of this talk. But the key point here is that these are just abbreviations because it turns out to be really boring to type out all the X's and Y's and A's and B's and all the rest, and the innumerably infinite set of possibilities, especially if you can't find lambda on your keyboard. So we've got abbreviations. Got two kinds of variables, bound variables. In other words, basically it's a parameter. You pass it in or it applies to something. And then free variables which are not bound in this context. Now it turns out there's no problem if you write this on a piece of paper, you never have to worry about scoping rules. It turns out that in programming we have to worry about this an awful lot. And that caused a lot of fun through the 60s and into the 70s. So let's, let's explore the differences here. If I wanted to define a function square, square of x, I'm defining it, everything I need to know is on the left-hand side. And then it expands on the right-hand side. If I do this from a lambda point of view, I'm simply saying, no, the thing on the right-hand side, I'm going to give it a name, but the thing on the right-hand side is a function regardless of anything else. That's what it is. It's always been like that. That's going to be the way it is. It also means, remember he said innumerably infinite? He, he didn't invent emoji, but he accommodated emoji, which I think is really cool, which means that that's a cross product. Um, yeah, sorry, it doesn't get better. It also means I can replace this with that. I had one person ask me, I did a, a user group version of this talk, one person uh, asked me, he said, wait a minute, have you not got the character set loaded? And I said, no, that's a square. It really is. Which, so the great thing here, I did actually toy with the idea of replacing it with a hexagon to keep uh, 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 Alistair happy and say I've got hexagonal architecture, but I couldn't make a real case for it because it's a square. Um, and it turns out you can apply it. There you go, that's a square of seven. I can easily replace it with that or replace it with this. These are all equivalent statements. They are identical. Now, let's go back to this. An unsolvable problem of number theory. The thing here is, the thing that's problematic is numbers. Because Church was trying to explore how, kind of how numbers worked. And it turns out the numbers are a bit too messy. So basically, he said, no, we're going to get rid of numbers. We're going to have no numbers. In fact, I'm going to invent numbers. Okay, so if you're looking for inspiration, kind of like for the software craft movement, Alonzo Church, we reject your commodity integers. We invent our own. He handcrafted a whole concept of integers because it turns out that normal integers are too complex. He needed a lambda version. So we're going to learn to count. As is traditional, we will start with nothing. And what does zero look like? Well, zero looks like this. Yeah, there's a few things there, and it's just that I'm not going to say anything about this yet. Let's talk about one. The bit you really need to be keeping your eye on is the bit on the right-hand side. So far, it's not very exciting, and you can't necessarily see a pattern. But then suddenly, when we hit two, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Fuh, 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 fuh. No, that's not me stuttering, trying to say something rude. It's the number of thirds. Whoa! In other words, numbers. So what he's done is he's basically said, what is zero? Zero is we take a lambda. We have a lambda that takes an f, a function, a lambda. And we, then we have another lambda that takes an x. And we just return the x. We don't do anything with f. One is this time we're going to apply f once. Two is we apply f twice. We apply f to x, then we apply f again to the result. Three, oh, you can see how this is going to go. In other words, 
what we're doing is really apply, we're, we are describing oneness and two-ness as application. We're not describing as many, many people think of them as numbers as being things, and these are certainly things, but rather applications. Threeness is the threeness, it's applying something three times. It is almost an iteration. We are actually not defining a traditional object, we are defining a process. So in other words, numbers are processes. So sixness is how we do it. We will do something six times, sevenness, and so on. Now, um, I can, uh, lambdas only, strictly speaking, take a single parameter. But it's so common that there's an accommodation to be able to do that. But as a general point, that basically means that kind of like partial uh, application and currying are built into lambda calculus. That's a notational convenience. We can also use another notational convenience. Another one, and you can see the regularity. Well, that's, that's, that's kind of nice, okay? Um, what does this mean for us? Not a lot yet, but it does have some interesting consequences. It means that there are a couple of languages. I'm going to use this one in Ruby, although the original inspiration is actually small talk. More on small talk later. I can take seven, and sevenness, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply it seven times. So in other words, I can actually tell the number seven, hey, here's a piece of code, oh, which is a lambda. Although, obviously, Ruby doesn't call them anything quite so. It has a, it has a rather baroque approach to uh, 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 this kind of thing. Some things are lambdas, some things are kind of procedure objects. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, seven, I've got this little fragment of code. I would like you to execute. Apply your sevenness to it. And it will do so. And this will print out numbers zero through six, and it will result in the number seven as its result. And it's just like, oh, that's kind of cool. So another observation from one of the Ruby pages, you may have heard of lambdas before. Perhaps you've used them in other languages. When people say other languages, what they normally mean is JavaScript. Um, so let's look at some JavaScript. Now, JavaScript's kind of interesting because it actually has lambdas built in from the very beginning, mid-1990s, mid-1990s. Brendan and I, it's a, it's a kind of a, a standard Standard joke that Brendan and I only took two weeks to create um, uh, and invent JavaScript, and we're still trying to work out what he did in the second week. Um, but one of the things that he wanted was he wanted a language like Scheme. More on Scheme later. But colleagues said, nobody's ever going to buy that syntax. You've got to use curly brackets. You know? So he changed that, and he borrowed a couple of other ideas. But it does mean that although this is a conventional way of defining square there, actually, here's another way. We're going to say there are only things. And there are all kinds of things. Let's put them on the right-hand side. And some of those things happen to be a function uh, uh, applications or something that I can apply. Um, ECMAScript 6 came along and said, oh, we can keep this nice and short and introduce a different notation um, that has slightly different rules. Uh, now that you've learned the previous rules for what functions are and are not, uh, here's some different ones. And a shorter notation. In fact, we can keep, keep this really short. And in this case, super short. So yeah, this is quite nice. And I can apply it but I can also apply it. In other words, this is properly a lambda. You can just take the expression, and you don't need the name, and you can just apply it to a parameter, and it evaluates. This is great. <laughs> Here's another one. They're anonymous little functional spies sneaking into the rest of your code. Well, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I mean, I've already got Facebook on the case, you know, busy breaking democracies and spying on all of my data and all the rest of it. And now you're telling me that my lambdas are doing this? But this also gives me an opportunity it gives me an opportunity to debunk some kind of common perceptions. A lot of people say, we've got lambdas, therefore it's functional. All things to do with functional programming are to do with lambdas, and all things to do with lambdas are functional programming. So there's a whole load of Java programmers who've been wandering around since 2014 going, hey, we've got functional programming now. Oh, sorry, mate, it's Java. You'll never have functional programming. Okay, <laughs> It's not a functional programming language. Oh, I've got some functional seasoning, and I can adopt certain functional styles, but it's still not functional programming, OK? You can, how do I know this? Um, well, one I've just actually, as of yesterday, delivered to production, uh, along with Trisha G, my co-editor, 97 things every Java programmer should know. So watch, watch, uh, watch Amazon for that. I hear we're going to spend a lot of time indoors very soon. So you might want to put that one on order. Um, see, see the plug? It's smooth. Um, but there's something else here. Is, a functional language is one that is optimized for functional programming. 
If you just try and define a simple function in Java, you will discover there's an awful lot of syntax. That's one of the reasons you know it's not a functional programming language. But there are other functional systems, and not all of them rely on lambdas. Um, one of the classic ones um, is Excel. Excel does not have lambdas, and yet it is a functional programming system. Yeah, I have seen a proposal for um, you know, Excel to have lambdas, and honestly, I really don't think it needs them. People are already making enough mistakes with spreadsheets as it is. Um, you know, spreadsheet errors were responsible for all kinds of mistakes we've seen across things like the medical literature. Um, uh, they, uh, spreadsheet errors were responsible for the austerity economics. So honestly, don't put lambdas in there. It's not going to help. But we do have this association. So what does it look like in Lisp? Because Lisp kind of started it all. It is a functional language. It looks like this. We have a particular notation. Um, the notation adopted in Lisp is, actually has a name. It's called Cambridge Polish notation. Um, uh, because everything's kind of backwards, um, but with parentheses. And as you can see in Lisp, these things are called lambda. There's a thing. There's our lambda. It takes x, and then we multiply x and x together. And if I apply it, then there we go. It actually is properly a lambda. And there is an elegance to Lisp and a simplicity that every now and then attracts people. Um, and this is one of those kind of interesting kind of coincidences. Uh, here's an XKCD. Notice, last night I drifted off while reading a Lisp book. Suddenly I was bathed in a suffusion of blue. If we go back, it's blue. I think it's a coincidence. I don't think Randall Monroe intentionally made it look like the original Lisp book. But, you know, I I'll take it. It was only when I put the slides together I realized the coincidence. At once, just like this said, I felt a great enlightenment. I saw the naked structure of Lisp code unfold before me. The patterns and meta patterns dance, syntax fade, and I swam the purified of quantified conception of ideas manifest. And there's even a little 2001 A Space Odyssey joke in there, which if you don't get, hey, guess what? You're going to have some time indoors coming up soon. Watch 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, truly, this was the language from which the gods wrought the universe. Uh, no, it's not. I mean, ostensibly, yes. Honestly, we had to get most of it together in Perl. So, I'm not going to show you Perl because I like you. Okay, I respect you as an audience. Um, so, I'm not going to show you Perl. I'm going to show you some PowerShell because PowerShell is, is a really nice little language. It's, it's very well put together. Most um, scripting languages, most shell scripting languages, look like a hand-me-down of a hand-me-down of a hand-me-down that Stephen Bourne came up with in a bad dream. Okay, um, but actually PowerShell's got some really nice ideas. It's also got a consistent object model, um, all kinds of stuff. So here is that lambda. Um, here's our parameter, $x, $x times $x. I can assign it to another value. I can pass it around. I can apply it to something, uh, or I can apply the whole expression. There you go. It's a full, fully-fledged lambda. So here's a point. We've got scripting, shell scripting languages that have got lambdas. Sure, we've got them in functional programming, but actually it turns out the lambdas these concepts existed in uh, procedural languages as well. No paradigm can actually fully lay claim to say, oh, lambdas are ours. So Algol 68 um, is a very influential language. Um, it's, uh, at the time, it was considered to be too large to implement, um, though these days it's actually really quite small compared with modern languages. Uh, but it introduced us to a number of ideas, some of which have not well, not all of which have made it all the way through. But what I like about it is it's unforgivingly procedural. It is a procedural language. Um, and it does a very good job of it. In fact, procedures are first class. It's such a procedural language that procedures are actually first class. So I can have a freestanding thing, take a real x, and then return a real and x times x. There we go. That's our friendly square lambda. We can go ahead and assign it. I can declare that, this is the type, and then I can apply it um, like this. Or I can actually freely apply it like that. So this is a standard feature. This was considered to be a necessary feature of procedural languages as of the close of the 1960s. Something really bad happened in the 1970s. We're not sure if it was disco. Um, we're not sure if it was flared trousers. But clearly, there was some kind of genetic bottleneck that we went through and came out the other side, completely oblivious to the fact that actually procedural languages could have freestanding procedures. Oh, and we're not done. It turns out that lambdas are objects as well. You've got the object people coming in and say, hello. Actually, I think you'll find they're object-oriented. Um, 
So there is a confusion here because everybody's trying to lay claim to this territory. They say, no, 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 it belongs to me. Um, and there's a, a nice, nice bit on um, uh, exchange on Usenet that patterns a, um, a particular dialogue after uh, characters, well, characters like the ones that Guy Steele, we'll see more of Guy Steele in a moment, uh, 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 explored. Um, the venerable master Kuknar was walking with his student Anton, hoping to prompt the master into a discussion. Anton said, Master, I have heard that objects are a very good thing. Is this true? These days we call this trolling. Uh, but this was written quite a few years ago. Kuknar looked pityingly at his student and replied, Foolish pupil, objects are merely a poor man's closures. Okay, let's talk about closures, because that's a term that gets thrown around a lot. The concept of closures was developed in the 1960s for the mechanical evaluation of expressions in the lambda calculus. It turns out that it's great having stuff on paper, but you can't actually make it run. I mean, you can stare at the paper as long as you like, but it isn't going to run. It's not going to use any electricity. You actually have to do something. You've got to code this up. And it turns out that there are a number of challenges that are kind of like those kind of things that a mathematician can easily brush aside in a paper. It's just like, yeah, but how does this run? What about the rules of scope? What does this mean when you pass this around? Peter Landon defined the term closure in 1964 as having an environment part and a control part. As, a, as an aside, this is worth pointing out that the... Um, for a number of years, I was confused by the fact that folks in Borland, in the Borland universe, in Delphi, were going around saying, we've got closures, and I'm looking at their thing called closure, and it's not a closure, it's just a bound method. And it's just like, it's gotten, it's, it doesn't really do anything, but it turns out that I can see from this quote why they might have thought that it was a closure, because it's got two parts, a pointer to an object, and then a pointer to some code, control part. It just happens to be a method. But here, we can have a freestanding piece of code. John Moses credits Landon with introducing the term closure to refer to a lambda expression whose open bindings the free variables, have been closed by or bound in by the lexical environment resulting in a closed expression or closure. Huh, nice. This usage was subsequently adopted by Sussman, Gerald Sussman and Guy Steele uh, when they defined scheme in 1975, a lexically scoped variant of Lisp and became widespread. So, chastised, Anton took his leave from his master and returned to his cell intent on studying closures. He carefully read the entire Lambda the Ultimate series of papers and its cousins. Lambda the Ultimate um, uh, was a series of papers uh, uh, by Guy Steele and other colleagues where they explored the fact that Lambda calculus seemed to be unreasonably effective at solving a lot of problems. And you can boil a lot of these things down to this. Um, and it's since become the name of a website where there's quite a lot of discussion of programming, language design, in particular functional programming. Um, and its cousin, and implemented a small scheme interpreter with a closure-based object system. Now, this is... Uh, book Gerald Sussman co-authored, Computer Science Classic, uh, the structure and interpretation um, of programs and uh, computer programs. And what and you see the lambda on the front. What is interesting here is that this is the definition, if you like, the heart of scheme can be written in scheme. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a trick first employed with uh, Lisp, the idea of define the language in itself. It's an idea that we encounter in many different forms. The idea of something that is self-hosting and can create itself is kind of like, whoa, a mind-blown moment. It's like the first time I discovered, wait a minute, how do you write a C compiler? And somebody said, oh, they're written in C. It's just like, that doesn't even begin to make sense. Okay, how, how do you do this? And it turns out that you, you kind of have to do it. There's a little bit of magic that people normally gloss over. It's just like, yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of bootstrap code there. But, you know, you have to do something rewrite the code generator and so on. There's a kind of a two-step process, but nonetheless, it reveals this powerful idea. You can write scheme and scheme, and then you simply have to create something that looks like this. Um, now, the simplicity of this actually has some interesting historical consequences. Um, why did they develop scheme in the first place? Well, they developed it as a series, uh, as, as a Lisp-based language. This work developed out of an initial attempt to understand the actorness of actors. Um, Carl Hewitt came up with the actor theory in 72, 73. Um, actors have kind of come in back, back into fashion again recently. Uh, and I did them for my master's thesis oh, decades ago. And uh, it was uh, kind of really interesting. Um, it was not obvious what Carl Hewitt was talking about. So this is why people, when you don't know what somebody's talking about, you go off and write some code. That has not changed. Okay? But your ability to be motivated by it and to, as an exploration, they said, right, we need to understand this. Let's build a thing. What should we call it? Well, at that time, there was a whole series of languages that were kind of doing this. They were called things like Mapper and Planner. 
And so they thought, let's call it schema. However, the file system had a limitation of six letters. So schema is seven letters long, drop the R, scheme. Boom, you're done. This interpreter attempted to intermix the use of actors and lisp lambda expressions in a clean manner. When it was completed, we discovered actors and the lambda expressions were identical implementation. This is the interesting thing. I saw a talk from uh, Guy Steele, I think it was 2006, uh, where he talked about this. And he said, look, we, ha we had the interpreter, and there was the bit that interpreted lambdas, and right next to it was the bit that interpreted actors, or alpha expressions, as they called them, and the code was identical. It's like, whoa, it's the same. It's the same idea. It just manifests itself differently. There's only one idea. So on his next walk with Quoknar, Anton attempted to impress his master by saying, Master, I have diligently studied the matter and now understand that objects are truly a poor man's closures. Quoknar responded by hitting Anton with his stick. OK, really there are some issues here about you know, how you treat your uh, inferiors, the people who work for you, and so on. There's a lack of respect in this workplace, I'm sensing. You know, this, we wouldn't get away with this now. However, when will you learn? Closures are a poor man's object. At that moment, Anton became enlightened. This is the thing. It turns out this is duality that runs all the way through this. This is why it turns up in so many different paradigms. Uh, William Cook um, uh, wrote this paper and gave a presentation in 2009 on understanding data abstraction revisited, where he made the observation that lambda calculus was the first object-oriented language. Now, here's a picture of um, the Seven Mountains, um, a sculpture just outside Las Vegas. Um, and of course, this is a perfect excuse to talk about stacks, because these are stacks of rocks, the most over-specified data structure in the history of computer science. Let us explore it some more. So I'm going to do this one in, um, uh, do this one in uh, uh, JavaScript, and I'm going to use a particular kind of form here. Um, I could just use a regular name function, but I'm going all out on lambdas here. So if you want to create a new stack, this is how you do it. There's a lambda expression that has a block of code that's going to return what is effectively a record or a Cartesian product of four named things, depth, top, push, and pop. And then each one of these is bound to a lambda. And this lambda has as one of its free variables a local variable called items. In other words, it captures scope, local scope. And then you pass out and you say, look, here is a, a record of operations. And they refer to this thing that is actually so private, it doesn't even need the private keyword. It's a local variable. It's actually genuinely local. What you've done is you've taken a block of code and kept it running. This idea was also part of another paradigm called structured programming. And a lot of people think of structured programming as go-to-less programming, but there's a little bit more to it than that. That's the first part of this book. It turns out there are two other parts to the book, but people never remember the rest. They just do the easy bit. Oh, yeah, the easy bit. Let's not use go to. Hard bit. What the hell's all that other abstraction stuff? Let's ignore that and just apply the first few ideas. One of the most powerful mechanisms for program structuring is the block and procedure concept. So, here in a derivative of um, Algol 60, we've got a block. Begin, end. The block was one of the great inventions, really introduced with Algol 58, but refined in Algol 60. And we've got an array of items. Rocks, to be precise, references of rocks. And we've got a count of how many we've got. And we're going to initialize that to zero. And then we've got a bunch of nested procedures, depth, top, push, and pop, because you can put procedures inside blocks. This is something that people have kind of forgotten about. That's what block structuring refers to. That everything can be put within a block, including blocks, including blocks. It is turtles all the way down. Now, this is the really cool bit. A procedure which is capable of giving rise to block instances which survive its call will be known as a class. And here's the insight. When you normally enter a block of code, you go into that first open curly, variables get pushed onto the stack. When you leave the closing curly, they go. But what if I kept that stack frame and I could pass a reference to it and I could pass that thing around? Thing doesn't sound technical enough. What about the word object? Yes, let's call it object. Honestly, if they've really been going for it, they could have said entity. You know? But they, they, didn't choose to, they didn't choose that word. So we can now pass a thing around, and it's got state. And it's got behavior. In fact, the language here is similar to 67. All you do is just put a class keyword in front. And it's like, right, now this creates something you can pass around. It's just an extension of the block idea, the closure idea. So this is quite deep. We could, of course, use any notation we want. Do not laugh at notations. Invent them. They are powerful. This is, this is Richard Feynman's observation. We've seen that you know, lambdas pop up in various different ways. And we understand there are lots of different notations for objects, procedures, and everything. But there is a kind of question here. In fact, mathematics is, to a large extent, the invention of better notations. 
Why did church use lambda? Well, there are a number of different stories. Um, there's a, the one that makes the most sense or the one that is most appealingly logical is the one I'm about to give you because there is another one where Church later in his life was asked, he said, I just like the look of the letter uh, or why not, which really doesn't help. It's like talking to a, I don't know, a client. Yeah? Um, so why, why, why is it that when we apply, you've got lambda A, why is it when we do this? It's like, why, why did we end up with this? Well, because originally, I wanted this. Ah, that explains why you can only have a single parameter originally. And he wanted to just have this simple notation. However, these are typesetters in America. You have to go to France to find convenient access to this kind of notation. Okay? And it's just like, man, we're not shipping that stuff in from France. Could you do something else? What about this? Yeah, that's not bad. What about this? Oh, yeah, I like it. Yeah? That's the story that is the most appealing. Yeah? It makes the most sense of it. But different languages realized they couldn't find it on the keyboard, so they had different solutions. So you know, Lisp and Python, they choose the word lambda. Haskell goes ultra minimal. It's just like it's, we're not even going to bother with the second stroke. Yeah. JavaScript went function. Closure uses fun, because apparently the vowel shortage is still on. Okay. I grew up during the great vowel shortage. I thought we'd left that one behind. But no. Yeah. But you know what's really funny? And I don't know if it's accidentally ironic or intentionally ironic, although given that closure comes from America, I think it's unintentionally ironic. Americans don't really do irony, um, which is ironic. Um, but uh, it turns out, what is the symbol, the logo for closure as a programming language is this. And yet the language has nothing that is called a lambda. It's not even referred to as lambda in the docs. These are anonymous functions. Do you have lambdas? No, we have things called anonymous functions. So why are you using a lambda as the layer? That is a mystery for you, student, to puzzle through. C++ says, hey, square brackets, because we've used every other kind for everything else. <laughs> but one of the great things is that there is a token sequence. This is a legit token sequence in C++11. What does it do? This is a lambda that does nothing. It takes nothing, gives nothing, does nothing. And here is how you execute it. Nothing. Silence of the lambdas. It's just like, whoosh. Everybody else, and everybody else has a couple of notations. They go, oh, right, OK. You know, JavaScript went for this. C Sharp went for this. Scala went for this. Java came along and said, ooh, that's pretty heavyweight notation. We're going to use fewer pixels. <laughs> and Groovy had this one as well. And kind of, yeah. So how do I do nothing? How do I do nothing meaningfully in Java? Well, this is how you do it. Well, actually, you can. Use, you can use an IDE, and that'll get the same job done. But here we go. And in C Sharp, it's going to look like this. There's only one problem, though, for the Java and the C Sharp. It turns out they're called lambdas, but they are not lambdas. So these are two languages that have a thing called lambda, whereas Clojure doesn't have a thing called lambda, but they are lambdas. C Sharp and Java have a thing called lambdas, but they're not lambdas. Well, to understand why, let us explore a little bit. So this is a lambda in Haskell. This is our square. If I use the Haskell interpreter and I say, please, tell me the type of this, it will tell me. Oh, this deals with classes of numbers, and you can apply, and you'll get a number from, you know, whatever, for whatever kind of number you've got, then you apply it, and you get the same, same type as the result. So lambdas have a type. I can do this as well in uh, Python. I can say, here's my lambda. Let me take the type of that, and it will tell me, oh, this is a class of function type things. That's great. Now, if I do this in C sharp, and I say, right, get me the type, it won't allow me to compile this. Okay? Operator dot cannot be applied to operand of type lambda expression. The logic being that you need to deduce some things. There's only one problem. There's nothing to deduce here. These are, there's nothing there. It returns, I can tell you what the return type is. It's void. How can you tell? Because I can read. It does, you know, there's nothing there to return. It turns out that these are merely syntactic forms. They break the idea that all expressions in a language have a type. It turns out that these are merely syntactic conveniences designed to generate something. It turns out if you want to execute it, you need all of this. So, whoa, what, what is that? So 
here's the three laws of a lambda. Turns out you can't apply them. You have to go through, you have to jump through hoops and actually create other objects to do that. So it turns out you can have that meaningful conversation when is a lambda not a lambda? You know, it's, it's, uh, so let us return to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and counting. Oh God, muttered Ford, slumped against the bulkhead and started to count to 10. He was desperately worried one day sentient life forms would forget how to do this. Only by counting could humans demonstrate their independence of computers. That ability is slowly fading. We've already lost the ability to think. We are outsourcing our knowledge to everything else. Soon we will forget how to count. Hey, what's the number after three? Wait a minute, let me go on and Google. Google says four, but I think that's fake news. I heard it was five. So let's go back to this stuff, okay? All of these. I'm going to use the long form because we can have a bit of fun. Well, the reason I'm going to use the long form is you can convert it very conveniently into JavaScript. Let us embrace the idea of the software craft movement and not use those wretched JavaScript numbers because they are actually quite wretched. Let us create our own numbers. These are handcrafted artisan integers. They will truly have the f-ness that we are after. Zero, well, we take f and we take x, we merely return x. One, we take f and x and we apply f to x. By the time we hit four, we're taking f and x and applying f to the result of f to the result of f to the result of f applied to x. So it is fourness, the idea of a process there. Now the question here is that we are carefully dodging the idea of what is it you're actually passing in? Because in the original lambda calculus, there were no other values. There were no types, there was only lambda. You had to pass in lambdas. So it seems kind of like, wait a minute, you pass in lambdas to lambdas and that's your numbers? Yeah, well, it turns out that in JavaScript, I do have a secondary number system and I can actually apply this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark that out by using a different color, which I believe is green, but I'm slightly colorblind. Is that green? Yes, excellent, good. Um, yeah, of all the struggles I have in this talk, RGB is one of them. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to say, ah, zero-ness. I'm going to give you a little piece of code, a lambda, that will take a number and return that number plus one. And then I shall apply that to, uh, let me borrow a zero from the JavaScript type system. And the result is zero. Well, that's not very exciting. Now it gets a bit more interesting. I shall do the same thing, but with oneness. And it applies it once. Then two-ness, it applies it twice. Ah, so it actually constructs. It turns out you can, the numbers work, they create numbers. Um, and if you're tired of you know, counting in decimal, then how about counting in unary? Yeah, forget binary, that's, oh my god, zeros, so boring. Um, let's do unary. It works like that, that's great. So, let's take square. What we're going to do is we're going to take a number and we're going to apply it to itself. So we're going to apply it just twice. So let's take seven. We're going to apply sevenness twice, because that's what square does. And we'll take that to zero. And the answer you've been waiting for for the whole talk, it's 49. It does give us the correct system. Now, this is kind of interesting, because it actually turns out that church encoding and church numerals can be used for a number of other things. 19th century, George Boole gave us a formalism, or gave us a formalization of propositional calculus. Boolean logic. So just in case, because we live in the post-truth era, I'm just going to put the word true up there just so you can f see and understand what truth is for a moment because it's in short supply and false. It turns out that we can create encodings for these. Huh. It turns out that this is exactly the same or similar system that is used in small talk where we are able to say truth and falsehood are not normal values. They are actually instances of objects. It turns out that I can take seven times seven, is it less than a limit? This is an if else. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send it query. If true, then return thumbs up. If false, thumbs down. It turns out that there is a class called true and it receives a message if true and if false. And all that it does is in this case, in the case of it being true, which it is because it's a class true. So this is kind of, this is polymorphic booleans it will evaluate that block of code. And if it's false, it'll evaluate the other one. So it turns out that Smalltalk uses this idea, which fe feels initially esoteric. As an aside, it turns out that if you look at the encoding of what false is, 
and we, it turns out you can replace the symbols. The symbols don't matter. This is a thing called alpha equivalence. It turns out that it's equivalent to something we've already seen. It turns out that false is zero. Yes, we've just reinvented C. It turns out that it's not a conversion to zero. It is zero. Yeah, so the C programmers can sit there and go, yeah, I knew I was right. I knew I was right. I knew it was zero. Damn it. But we can do other things. We can even do further data abstractions. We can create pairs. We can bind two lambdas together and do all kinds of crazy stuff. We can abstract pairs. We can get the first value or the second value. And it turns out that we can use stuff we've already seen here. We can even define nil and then just rename everything. And suddenly, we've just reinvented Lisp. It's all there in 1936. All the possibilities are there. So I'm going to close with a slightly off the wall application, because clearly no talk is complete without FizzBuzz. So let's look at how you do FizzBuzz. The idea of FizzBuzz, for those who are not familiar, it's a counting game. It's a drinking game. Um, you count, one, two, three, four, five, except you replace everything divisible by three with fizz. One, two, fizz, four, buzz. Oh, everything divisible by five is buzz. And then by the time you hit 15, anything divisible by three and five is fizzbuzz. So fizzbuzz is a classic programming challenge. How do we do this? And what is this language? Well, it looks like it's kind of simple. But this doesn't look like a familiar language. That's because it isn't. This is Tom Stewart's, um, this is from Tom Stewart, refactoring to nothing, sorry, programming with nothing. From understanding computation, what he does is he says, imagine, let us imagine we don't have anything except lambdas. Okay, how are we going to solve FizzBuzz? And he does an encoding where he creates his own booleans, his own numbers, his own operations, his own if statements, his own map statements. And this is what it looks like in its complete form. Good luck debugging that. But it is one of the most esoteric, in other words, I used abbreviations on the previous slide. But this is the lambda, the pure, pure lambda version of FizzBuzz. Of course, I'm not suggesting that you go and put this into your code on Monday. This is not safe for work. Yeah, jo uh, yeah job security, good suggestion. Forget everything I just said. I want to bring this to a close by making a couple of observations. What we've seen here, some of it feels a little esoteric, but all of it is very, very deep. It, there is a deep unifying idea here that underpins and allows us to recognize in many different programming languages and indeed many different paradigms that there are forces at work that actually keep say, wait a minute, this is the same idea expressed elsewhere. But it also gives us a different insight into how to think about numbers, how to think about data abstraction. It also tells us really that what a lambda is um, is actually a little bit different from what people expect it to be. And it, was, it served a completely different purpose. It was merely a tool to achieve a proof end, but not anything more than that. It was only later that people realized, you know what, there's a lot more to this. And so I hope with that journey, you have discovered that we have arrived back where we started and now we fully understand or are fully confused and in need of coffee. Either way, thank you very much. <laughs>